Okay, if they have that, it's a polynomial. You can find p of x for any value of x. In other words, its domain is negative infinity to infinity because you just have power functions and you don't have any negative powers, right? So you can take any positive power of any number. Okay, all the positive power functions are non-negative power functions. Have domains from negative infinity to infinity, right? Okay, because, again, you can take any non-negative power of any real number. And then you can multiply powers of different uh, values of x, multiply them by numbers and add them up, and you still get a result. So it's pretty obvious that any of the polynomials I've written down here, you plug in any number x, then it's going to give you a value. Okay. The domain of polynomial is negative infinity infinity. Okay? The range might not be negative infinity infinity. Like the range of a quadratic is not negative infinity infinity. Quadratic expressions are polynomials, right? So you either go from the vertex up or from the vertex down. So your range, your values of y, you're either from here up or from here down. So they either go from whatever the y value of the vertex is to infinity or from the y value of the vertex to negative infinity. Okay? And we should understand that because we've talked about domains and so forth. Um, also continuous, there are no breaks. The graph doesn't do this and then suddenly jump up to here with no numbers in between. Okay? And that's just because if you put a number close to x in, you get a number close to whatever p of x was. Okay? Put two numbers that are close together. If you make them close enough, you can make the values as close together as you like. Okay? Now that's an idea that you really formalized in, com in, in calculus. Um, so and it's not one we're going to do a lot. It just means the graph can be drawn without taking your pen off the paper on any of them. Okay? Okay, so there are no breaks anywhere. Um, And continuous and smooth, meaning no sudden changes in slope. Okay, like no corners. Okay? And we've seen what the graphs look like. They typically look something like this. like this. They're smooth. Okay? If you're driving a car along the things, you can stop looking for a minute. If you're driving slow enough, you don't run into a wall at the corner, right? You might go off the road a little bit, but you're not going to... You still don't want to... Maybe you still pay attention. You get the idea. Okay? Drive slow enough, you don't have to make any sharp sudden turns. You might have to make some fairly sharp turns, but you don't have to make them suddenly. Um, okay. 
Uh, now, again, what I'm going to tell you is kind of hard to prove. You got to use calculus to prove it. Okay? Or at least see the proof of calculus. The various ways to prove it. Calculus is the easiest. Um, If the graph goes from below the x-axis to above the x-axis, it goes through the x-axis. In other words, you can't get from below to above without going through the x-axis, right? It's because of the continuity. Okay? It takes a little bit to prove that. Prove that really is so. But it's so obvious that you might think it doesn't need to be proved, and for your purposes, at least at this point, it doesn't. You're not ready to see the proof. We're getting you ready to see the proof. You don't want to see it. But you want to understand it. The same thing if you go from above to below. the x-axis, right? Okay. This is called the intermediate value theorem. And if we're looking for zeros, places where a, a polynomial goes through the x-axis, okay? If we're looking for zeros, if we find a point where it's below the x-axis and a point where it's above, we know there's a zero in between, okay? So if we've got an interval where at one end of the interval it's below, on the other end of the interval it's above, that some number in that interval gives you zero when you plug into the function. Okay? And you can do that, if you can find an interval like that, then you can start narrowing down where that zero is. Okay? Like, you can say, okay, it's negative here, it's positive here. Now, let's see what it is in the middle. Now, what if it's positive in the middle? What's that tell you? About where it goes through zero. A lot of blank looks, I have to draw a picture. Right? Okay? So, here you go. Here's x. Of course, your y axis is up this one. Right? I'm not worried about the y axis. Okay, so we have an interval here. Now, you're used to saying intervals because we've used intervals to define fundamental triangles and slopes, right? Okay, so here's an interval of your x-axis. Okay, and let's say that we evaluate the function at this side end of the interval, and we get a value down here, and we evaluate here, we get a value up here. Okay. Well, this tells us that there's a zero in the purple interval. There might be more than one. You know, the graph might do wiggle around several times before it goes back up there. It won't sawtooth because that'd be sharp corners, but it smoothly wiggles, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay.
it got to be a zero in the purple interval. Okay. Makes sense? Okay. So now we cut the purple interval in half and get the yellow interval. Okay. Well, I put a yellow point right over the purple point. Okay. Then with this yellow interval gives us this value, right? So whatever x is here, you plug it in, see if it's positive or negative, right? Okay. Do you want it to be positive or negative? I know. You want it to be positive. Because we're all Oh, uh, okay. So it's positive. Okay. So does the graph got to have a zero in the yellow interval? I mean, it has to have a zero in the purple interval because it has to smoothly go from here to here, right? got to go through the x-axis and that's going to give you a zero because that's what a zero is. Point where goes, the graph goes through the x-axis. Point where the function has a value of zero. Okay, so uh, well you can get from this point to this point without going through the x-axis, can't you? So Don't got to be a zero. But where does it have to have a zero? Sorry? In the purple. Well, we know it's got one in the purple. Can we say more than that? To the left side of the yellow. Yeah, well, and we can say, but it's then got to have one in the part of the purple interval that's left when you take away the yellow interval, right? So I'm going to say that a little more compactly. It's got to have one of what's left of the purple interval, right? Okay. Now, it's implicit that I mean what's left of the purple interval after I take away the yellow interval, right? And I don't want to say that. I can put that in set theoretic terms and use a bunch of notation and vocabulary that just confuse the issue for most people, okay, at this point. But understanding just in the vernacular what we're talking about, then later, if I want to put it in a little more formal notation, you'll have the idea and you'll see what it means. Okay? Uh, and just to be sure we understand, this orange interval The orange interval is what's left when the yellow is removed from the purple, right? Because in the 
orange interval. Now we've got this point down here and this point up here. And I could make both of those orange, right? Indicate the end points of the orange interval. So I've narrowed it down. If I take the middle of the interval, then I always know that the, you know, if I find an interval first where we have a point below and a point above at the ends, you know, at one end, the polynomial is negative, at the other end is positive. Okay? I divide that interval in half and see whether it's positive or negative at the new end point that we get. And then I can determine whether zero occurs in this interval or this one, depending where this one is. If this one had been below, then I'd have known that there's a zero in the yellow interval. Okay? So it's a pretty simple idea. I want you to. Uh, I want you to work on it. So, okay. Now, to apply that idea, I want to apply that idea to x squared plus 5x plus 5. Okay? And uh, what I want you to do is Okay, we want to find an x value that makes p of x positive and one that makes p of x negative. And let's say, you know, x values less than 5, or between negative 5 and 5, okay? Now, when x is negative 5, it's positive. When x is 5, it's positive. You can't use negative 5 and 5. So just start evaluating that for x values, okay? And you could like start with 0, 1, 2, okay? And then think about what you're getting. You might not want to go too far if you don't find a 0. You might want to go to negatives. Or you go 0 and then you go 1 and negative 1 and 2 and negative 2, whatever, okay? So work it out.